Well, welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. As many of you know, I am an advocate for medical assistance in dying, or MAID, as it's called. Even had some legislation passed in the Senate regarding advanced directives. I recently went through the whole MAID process with an old and close friend, so it caught my eye when I saw that there was a new book about MAID, but for children. As it turns out, it is the work of someone I've known for many, many years, and many of you will know his name and his work and his voice from his 30 years on CBC Radio or in his humorous award-winning books for adults and children, more than 25 in all. So I am so pleased to welcome Bill Richardson. Great to see you. You too. I can't tell you what a tonic it is to look at your beautiful face. It's, it's oh been, my God. It's, it's, it's been so long and I'm so happy to have this chance to talk to you. I'm, I'm honored more than I can say, truly, truly. Oh, well, it's just fun. So you're in Vancouver. I am. Um, even though you're a good Winnipeg boy, you're a good Prairie boy, but. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I grew up in Winnipeg and I still have a house, not in, not in the city, but in yeah. a village about two and a half hours west of there. Crystal City is the name of the village. Wow. And, and uh, I, I haven't been able to be there much over the last couple of years, you know, owing to the C word and everything. Yes. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I miss it a lot. It's, it's a beautiful community. And um, yeah, I, I'm going to get back there as soon as I can. It's so great getting getting back there and just just smelling the air you grew up smelling i didn't yes. grow up in the country but nonetheless the aesthetic is very much the same that's fantastic yeah i find that i mean i i'm back in saskatchewan a lot and it grounds me and i find my roots and the conversations i have are real it's not the stuff that goes on um in ottawa or over dinner party conversation oh. uh, i know you know the level of what, what i like most about it i, I like lots about it is that there's a level of caring that's just yeah. extraordinary you know yeah. I, I, my house it's, it's empty I, I, empty of me in any case and and yeah. uh, i've got these amazing neighbors who look out for it and deal with the snow and there's been lots this year to deal with um there's this, this thing happened uh, a couple of years ago it was um there, there was a across the street from where i live there's a grain elevator and yeah. it's it's still in use and there was a fire there, uh, one of those grain elevator fires, some mm -hmm. weird uh, conflagration, just a, a spark in the grain, and, and, and up it went. And in a little town like this, I mean, this, this is a huge event, of course, it'd be a huge event anywhere. And from all around the community, from all the Hutterite colonies nearby, from Pilot Mound, from Clearwater, from Morden, from any of the places you could name that were within 50 miles or so, every volunteer fire department came pouring into town. And a good thing they did too, because it began to spread. And uh, there was a building on the main street that went that went up and the whole, the whole yep. town could have gone. That could have happened. But to, I, I don't think I've ever been quite so moved by anything as that by seeing this immediate uh just loving caring response from so many people and who who would receive exactly the same were they in the same situation and it happens all the time i mean when somebody loses a loved one i mean the first thing you do is take food and you know you get to so-and-so's house and their cupboards are stacked with you know cookies and lasagna and cake and frozen you know there's just a, a community spirit which is um genuine and lovely and comforting yeah for yeah. sure all right i'm going to hold up this beautiful book it's called last week um, by Bill Richardson, of course, illustrated by Emily Leduc. It's it's spare. It's spare, but it's beautiful. So tell us a little bit about how this book came to be. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the origin story, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 can, it can start to sound a little like somebody telling you their dream, you know, so just let's have a signal if, I, if I'm going on too long. But okay, well, was, give us the Reader's Digest version. That's okay. what we'll do. <laughs> okay. well, there, 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 first of all, there was an event. There was a prime moving event, and that was my my partner, whose name is, is, is also Bill. I mean, you don't have to be in a same-sex relationship to have a partner by the same name, but... But that it, is odd. Well, well, you know, I used to live in a house next door to Lisa and Lisa, and across the street were Laura and Laura. I mean, 
Okay. So think about having a partner. Other bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you have a partner with the same name. You, you can tattoo their name without fear because it's always going to be your own. Anyway. Good so, point. Good um, point. Bill's Bill's mother, Judy Peckett, who was a remarkable woman. Uh, she was 92 when she died. This would have been in September of 2016, shortly after the legislation was enacted. The first mm -hmm. legislation. And um, she she had a medically assisted death. And the physician who was there for her was Stephanie Green. Uh, yeah. I, know, I know you know what I've worked with in, in the work that you've been doing with the Senate. Uh, St Stephanie is a, a very leading advocate of medi a medically assisted An amazing death. woman. An amazing woman. She has, a, she has a new book out, a, a memoir about her life. So there was that. I, I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't present with 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 Judy when she when she actually passed, but I was there in the house. Uh, this is in Victoria. Over the last couple of days of her life, when people just gather, and uh, family and friends, and she held court, which is what she was. She was magnificent at doing that. She was an incredibly gregarious social person, hugely bright. She was one of the lucky people who managed to be uh, absolutely herself in her head up to the last minute. And she, but her her body was failing. She had congestive heart failure. She was legally blind. The bloom was substantially off the rose. And when she first applied for a medically assisted death, she was turned down, but she was determined and she, when she found a way to make it happen, to, to get the sign off signatures. And so it was done. So I, I was very, again, this is something that, that, that impressed me and moved me. And then I, I had a job uh, for a couple of months at the University of Manitoba as, as a writer in residence. You know, one of yep. those jobs where you meet with people who talk about their writing. And um, part of the deal is that you get time to work on something. And there, there was this image that I'd had in my head that was, that I was, I don't know why, it was just kind of following me around. And it was the image of a woman in a wetsuit walking down to a beach. So there was that. And and I've been talking to some friends in, in Winnipeg about their daughter, who was a very... Um, uh, talented, is a very talented young person, but was anxious as, as she was growing up. She was a perfectionist and she was a bit of a math genius, like more than a geek. She, she was really, really gifted. And one of the things she said to them, and this, I found this so interesting, was that she found numbers comforting. So yeah. all those things, those three things, Judy's dying, the woman in the wetsuit, and a child who takes comfort in numbers. And those because two things came That's what this about is that this child actually counts down days, hours, seconds, seconds to yeah. the loss of a grandmother yeah. who it's has made more. that choice. It's a, yeah, exactly. The grandmother has made that choice. And the child is there with uh, the, their father. I mean, it's, I, this, it's this question of pronouns here. Um, uh, just, just to say, when, when, I wrote, when I wrote the book, it wasn't clear to me. It wasn't apparent to me. It wasn't even very interesting to me whether this was a boy or a girl. And the right. only thing that I said specifically to to the publisher to pass on to the illustrator, because the way the way children's books typically works, uh, I shouldn't say typically, but but often what will happen is that if if you are a writer as I am who doesn't draw and you're passing off the work to somebody else to to do the graphic stuff, yeah. then. Um, usually you don't have any contact with them and that's good because it means that oh. the person can do his or her or their uh, own own interpretation which is what Emily did here but the one thing I said was I don't know if this is a boy or a girl you make up your own mind and I think that she yeah. produced a drawing that was very kind of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for androgynous. yes androgynous. you can choose it's it is really true you know I, I read it and and I didn't think whether it was a boy or a girl yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I, I I haven't really had many test runs with it, but uh, I, I showed it to a few friends who have read it with their their, their kids who are age appropriate, and, and age appropriate for a book like this is probably eight to eight to ten, eight to eleven. I yeah, think. yeah. Uh, and uh, it tends to be that the boys see it as a boy, and the girls see it as a girl. Yeah. Yeah, so some people have said this is a non-binary child, but I, I don't know. That wasn't my intention. I mean, yeah, it, no, it, it just it is in any in case. the eye of the beholder. Yeah, so so the, the the child is there with her father, and um, the mother is coming later. It's the father's mother who has chosen to have a medically assisted death, and um, the child's experience is very much like mine. Neighbors and friends come, and yeah. over the course of these this last week, these seven days, the child has a chance to hear hear some stories and to uh, see their grandmother in good days and in bad, and to ha have a chance to to say the things that are important. You know, Stephanie said, uh, because she's written the afterword in your book, Stephanie Green, who we've been talking about. Uh, and, and I will just say this, her book, 
and this is the title. This is Assisted Dying, a doctor's story of empowering patients at the end of life. And the stories are compelling and amazing and funny and heart-wrenching and all of those things, just because she's such a great person. But what she says in, in the end, uh, what she's written here is that contrary to our instinct mm -hmm. as adults to want to protect children from the reality of death or loss and you know, try and gloss over the story that kids that are informed, that people talk to actually have less anxiety. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true. I'm, I'm, I'm in a slightly difficult situation of being a childless person. I mean, I, I yeah. can't have experience yeah. on this. Yeah. I, I do remember, however, being a child, which is, I think, mostly what informs most adults writing books for, for a young audience. So right. I think I can make a pretty good guess at it. And I think, I think that's absolutely, I'm sure that Stephanie in saying that is, is absolutely right. Anybody wants to know. Yeah. Funny, isn't it funny the things, the things we want to know. I was thinking about this, with that whole counting business and, and um, I, I remember one, one of the, something else that was kind of on my mind was, was, was my, my father who died in 2014. So before the legislation came in, with and dementia. He, he had dementia, yeah. yeah. And and uh, some kind of unspecified dementia. It was never named as Alzheimer's, but in any case, that was his situation. Right. And uh, he'd had a couple of mishaps, falls. He'd broken both hips. He never recovered. He never gained mobility. It was okay. a, a classic story. But had he been uh, sound of body and not clear as a bell, he probably could have lived at home. But as, as it was, he went to live in care. And that was when I moved back to Winnipeg to, to, to be with him. I thought it was for a couple of months, but it turned out to be two and a half years. And it was actually, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. But I remember him um, once in a, a, a sort of lucid moment. And in fact, he, he had many of them say, saying to me, oh, I just, if I could just blow myself up right now, if I could just yep. blow myself up and not take you out with me, I would do it. And I'm sure that he he absolutely would have availed himself of this had it, yeah. had it been open to him. And that whole interesting question that I know that you're very much involved with uh, in, in the Senate work you're doing about- uh, Advanced directive. Advanced directive, yeah. Right. Especially around of dementia it's 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 a really really important discussion well that was my own experience with my own mother i too went and spent uh several years there and and we had as a family had long discussed this you know with dnrs whenever they were in a hospital or you know they did not want to live like that they wanted to live fully aware and fully engaged but you know dementia is that catch-22 yeah you know i, I gotta say though uh, as I think about it, I, I, I've never really come to a very, very sturdy branch that I can build my nest on on this. I, I, I waver a little bit about it. Hmm. And one of, one of the things that struck me about Stan, I, I, my dad, I call him Stan, yeah, um, was that uh, uh, although he he was lost, he was he felt isolated, he was frustrated a lot of the time. Yeah, that wasn't his twenty four seven reality. Yeah. He still had pleasure in certain things. He, he he laughed still. He told jokes. He uh, it, it wasn't a constant misery for him. Right. And so when I remember that, I think, yeah, well, you know, there it, it wasn't as though this was a life that had that, that wasn't worth living. It wasn't as though this was a life that had no value to the person most involved in it, i.e., him. No, no, uh, exactly. And, 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 yeah, so it, it's it's not. These questions aren't straightforward, and and, no. and one, of the things, one of the things that I wanted to do when when, when writing this book, um, well, first of all, again, it, it wasn't it wasn't really my first intention to write a book about maid. Not to be disingenuous, I know I know very very well that this is what happens in the book, and that this is what people are interested in, and so am I. I don't disavow that in any yeah. way. But for me, it's it's really it's a story about family and love, and 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 maid is maid is a. Uh, a player in that story, an important player to be sure. But sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I re, when I when I sat through this process, went through this process over several weeks with with my friend last fall. There was a person, another friend of hers that I came to know but didn't know well, and we went through this made process. At the end of which, and I was sitting there holding her hand when she was gone, uh, and um, and. And he stayed in the room and it turns out he was a person of faith yeah. and 
he was struggling with death and is death fair? And why did this person who was so full of life and, but cancer came and then really having a hard time getting his head around choosing death and reconciling that with a belief in God and a belief in an afterlife and a yeah. belief, you know, I think everybody struggles with this. This is yes. not. And it, it divides families as well. Yeah. I mean, this, this, I'm starting to uh, find myself on the path of some stories now that the book has come out. I ran into a friend the other day, someone I hadn't seen for many, many years, who told me that his, his father had chosen a medically assisted death. And it has driven a wedge in that family, a serious yeah. wedge, because people didn't agree. It was, it was his wish. They honored his wish. Yeah. But they didn't agree with it, half the family. Again, there so much comes into play. Uh, uh, around these questions. It, it can be religion or uh, yep. uh, ethics or um, practicalities or uh, simple aesthetics. You know, I shouldn't say simple aesthetics. There's no such thing as simple aesthetics. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's, it's not, um, it's not a, an easy question. Well, and some of the kids have been um, maybe away, you know, the, the adult children of somebody who chooses this, yes. they didn't, they haven't seen the decline or they don't, you know, there's a whole lot that goes into this process, but the bottom line is it has to be the person's choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. One of the things that happened with my dad over the course of all this was that uh, speaking of wedges being driven. Yeah. Uh, he, um, so I, I was his, um, I, I, I held the medical directives and, and, yeah. and um, uh, but his, his brother, who was his, his older brother, uh, Hugh, a wonderful guy uh was uh, he was very upset he he was he was mostly upset that his his younger brother had had dementia i mean he said to me once we, we, richardson don't go crazy we just don't go crazy but I mean, yeah. it wasn't what had happened to stan he had dementia no. <laughs> and, but i point taken and he hugh at that is was a very big believer in um homeopathic medicine mm -hmm. and uh or naturopathic medicine i suppose and Anyway, he thought that all Stan needed was like a big old shot of B12 and he would be up dancing a hornpipe and reciting the periodic table of elements <laughs> and so on and so forth. And that, that wasn't going to happen. Anyway, to make a long story short, too late for that, Bill. Uh, we, we stopped speaking. Yeah. And uh, the last time I saw him was at, at my dad's funeral in, in 2014. Skip forward to last year. And uh, he was turning 100. And oh you know, he, I know he'd been on a farm. He'd lived on his farm until uh, yeah. about the age of 98. And I, I got an email, a mass email, group email from one of his daughters, my cousin, saying, well, dad's turning 100 and COVID, we can't gather, but send some fond wishes if you would like. And I thought, well, we haven't spoken for four years, <laughs> but 100 is 100. Yeah. So I sent him some flowers. And, and lo and behold, he got these flowers and he called me. And we had a little chat and it was really, really nice. And, and, and I felt like a, a, we, we'd affected a kind of rapprochement. Yeah. About three weeks later, he called again. And it was a Saturday afternoon. I'd been working. I started really, really early. I was tired. I was just lying down. I was going to have a nap. And I saw the phone. I thought, what's Hugh going on? Bill, answer it. So I did. I'm so glad I did. Because he said, well, you know, I've turned 100. <laughs> you yes, know that. Yes. And he said, well, here's the thing. I'm not really very happy living where I am. By this time, he was living in care. I'm not really happy living where I am. And I can't see that things are much going to change. So I've decided to go to heaven. And I'm going to go on Monday. And I just wanted, oh, you, to know, God's sake. And I just <laughs> wanted you to know. I just wanted you to know, he said, there are no hard feelings. And I just thought, oh, my God, what a mensch. Like what, yeah. what a great guy to take this time from his last days just to, to do that. But that's one of the things about this when yes. you have time to choose, you uh, the opportunity to choose, you have time to say goodbye, you yeah. have time to settle scores yeah. or rapprochement, as you say, like you, this is an important part. I mean, lots of times we don't get to do that. No. No, it's true. It changes a lot about the way we mourn and the way yeah. we prepare ourselves for the for, for the death. Even if it's a death that you know is going to come, yeah, uh, it's sooner rather than later. If there's actual if, if there's an actual appointment, then yeah, yeah you you gear yourself up in a different sort of way. 
It's, I it's, just thought my friend handled it well. I mean, there were several gatherings. We yeah. had Thanksgiving. I mean, of course, she was beyond eating at that stage, but she she was always a person who was the host. And, and yeah. so she all she I mean, what she said is, I just want to hear you all downstairs having a good time. Oh. Um, and then we went up one, you know, we each went up one by one and just spent so that there was no party in her room. I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. And she had a chance to say things. So I just, I don't know, my experience uh, with this is so positive because I yes. yeah. you know, I think it gave her control in the last days and weeks and hours and minutes and seconds, just as your book says. And, and, um, and it also accommodates people whose, whose wish is quite other to who, who yep. want to be quiet um, at, towards the end and just to have the, the, the yep. chance to think their own thoughts. Where was your friend, Pamela? Was she in Saskatchewan? In, she, no, this one was in Toronto and we had a young made doctor like Stephanie. I, I find the people who take this on are so compassionate by nature. Yeah. Um, you know, and they have lived other lives in the case of Stephanie. I mean, she was an obstetrician. Like yeah. they they are doctors and they've seen a voice and they've come. And both of the doctors, it was another one they're sort of assisting. And they said they were just so amazed with, you know, her spirit and, yeah. you know, everybody in the room. And she, they said, you know, too often we are with somebody by themselves, not by choice, but because they are alone. Yeah. Do you and, think, is there, is there much of a, a conflict, do you think, between physicians who, I'm sorry to be asking this, you may have no way of knowing, I suspect this is something you, you, you've confronted. I, I have not, but I'm just curious. Uh, I wonder if there's any kind of conflict, or not, not maybe a conflict, but at least debate between physicians whose impulses towards palliative care and those, who's, those who are um, delivering made services. Do you but think? I think that's the whole point. That's, you know, the, the, the people who are, are clearer about this, and that doesn't mean, of course, that it, it it's their personal decision. But, you know, we've got well over 85% of the Canadian population who says, let people choose. Uh -huh, yes. They may not choose it themselves, but let people choose. We have right. choice on so many issues. Yeah. And I think, I think the medical profession is like that by and large. There are, of course, you know, there will be people who are offended by this morally and ethically and on the grounds of do no harm and all of those things. But yeah. I think there's an acceptance because, of course, palliative is there for some, yes. and it may be the right option for some. But if you know you're going to have a horrible last three months because cancer is ravaging your body, yeah. you know, um, then have another choice, right? I mean, there's only so much palliative care you can offer at that point. So yes. I do think there's and I, you know, Stephanie certainly has had those issues. Any doctor that's a practitioner has come up against that. But, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it, this is going to be a debate. And I think, it, I mean, even in the countries where this has been going on for 20 or 30 years, the debate's still underway. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think we're in a place where it gets particularly heated. And I did think about this while, while writing last week, I mean, is that, if the person receiving made, and I don't think this can happen in Canada right now, is in fact a child. So I mean that, that that's I, yeah. I know that I, I think in it can't Belgium, happen. Yeah. It can't happen, no. Yeah. But but it's 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 obviously a question. It's one of those questions that people are going to be wrestling with. And of course yeah. it brings up the whole specter of, of the of the Latimer case and 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 all of that. Yeah. But it's that that's that's its own very, very charged issue. There are so many issues, of course, and 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 when, when I was writing the book, I, I knew, well, I, I can't, this is not my intention here. This is not my purpose. I, 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 I'm, I'm not here to address that. I'm here to tell a very simple story of what yeah. it's like in the ground. Of what you saw. But if, if, the, if the book within families or in whatever yeah. context opens a discussion, then I think that's to the good. I hope it does. Or, or it's there for somebody who might experience it and that will give them a little path or a guide for them if they are a child. That perhaps, yeah. perhaps. Again, there's, uh, I think I, I get nervous around children's books that are meant to be prescriptive in some way. You know, yeah, your, are, your book is not prescriptive. Oh, I'm not no, saying, yeah. No, no, I don't no, no, no. I, 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 th thanks. Yeah, that, that's, I, I wouldn't have, I couldn't have, I couldn't have done that.
Yeah. I, I think it, uh, it's, it's kind of, um, I, I wanted something that was going to, going to be open-ended. Uh, yep. so. Now, there is an entire other reason for our conversation today. And it is about life decisions. So you're, you're ready and willing to talk about all the things that have happened in your life. 30 years on and off at the CBC, a career you said you fell into, but which offered you a life of the mind. Yeah, right. sort of, kind of. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> the, the best thing I ever heard said about the CBC and my own participation <laughs> came from, was Lorna Crozier. Yeah. Uh, Lorna Crozier said to me once, she was talking about her, her late husband, Patrick Lane, and she said, uh, she said, oh, Patrick and I were talking the other day, and she, and we we agreed that it's such a good thing that we have the CBC so that people like you have a place to work. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I so, think that is hey, a shelter workshop, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, there are a lot of people who share that view and aren't quite so generous about it. <laughs> well, that's that's so. I know we've all had many experiences of the CBC. Most of mine were yeah. happy. All, you know, really, all of mine were. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Had a, I had a really, really good kick at the can of the CBC, but but also it was for, for, for me, uh, and I, I did a bit of work in TV, but most of my work was yeah. in radio. It was radio, yeah. Was, I mean, anybody looking at us now will say, "Not a face meant for the television." <laughs> um, but uh, but but uh, when when I started there, and I'm not, maybe this is still the case to a certain extent. I, I've got really no way of knowing, so take that into account. But I think for the most part, people who are hired now at the CBC are people who who come to it with, um, well, actual journalism chops, right? They, they, they've got uh, journalism degrees. Now, I don't know if, if if that's necessarily true of a host like I, I, Tom Power, who was who's a wonderful host and 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 whose stock and trade is his engaging personality and and just the, the depth of his knowledge he can carry on a conversation but for the most part the people who were there i, I think it's expected that you have a journalism degree that was not so when i started there it was a yeah, place no that, not not me yeah. either yeah. It, 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 it could accommodate characters that could accommodate yeah. eccentrics it was sort of the, the the waning days of people like max ferguson and alan maitland and that whole crowd who were yeah. oddballs in lots of ways and and i i was i was there as a bit of a junior oddball at least at the start <laughs> Well, I, we're going to explore this, but but there was a story written in the Globe and Mail recently yeah. uh, about Bill Richardson, 30 years at the CBC with this living with the literati and the glitterati, and now is stocking shelves uh -huh. at the Whole Foods grocery store, yeah. which I think is just amazing. But the process to get there when you've had this other life mm -hmm. and now you've got people coming up to you and saying, Oh my goodness, you must be doing research for a story or surely to God, you're not doing this for the money. And I know. Yeah. This, yeah. This not the, uh, anyway, just to share a little bit of your experience around that. Well, okay. So um, I, I parted company with the CBC or the CBC parted company with me. I, 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 I had been there on, uh, year to year contracts for many many years. I was never a staff person, uh, so, so, uh, and and I never wanted to be a staff person. I, I I was glad of my contract arrangement because I didn't want to be somebody who was going to be I don't know an H uh, a human resources problem when whatever show you were doing <laughs> wound down. And then they said, oh, I'll put them on the morning show chasing stories or something. So I did. Yeah. I just didn't want to do that. So I I I, cl I clung to to my contract thing. Anyway. Um, it was time for a party in the ways it simply was and 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 one was affected it was done with great care and courtesy I, I i felt no bad feelings about it then and i don't know and you were doing some program that you didn't even really want to do well I, something, something I didn't want to the do. Opera. yeah i was i was hosting saturday afternoon of the opera which is a venerable program and a really fine program ben Hatter hosts it now and 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 has done for the last number of years well since i left uh and and um i when when they offered me the, the the job, I was really I was excited to take it and and interested to take it. Opera is a a kind of a connoisseur field and a specialty field, and and I I came to it with a generalist's knowledge. It was well within my comfort zone, but I I I I, I could never uh, 
claim the, the kind of expertise that the, the, the real opera fan can. In any case, um, uh, what I did was I, I worked hard at presentation in one thing or another, and, and it, it, was, it was okay. I, I never really felt at one with it. And I don't think it, it ever really felt at one with me. Well, anyway, yeah. so, so off I went. And um, I, again, I was living in Winnipeg at the time and looking after my dad, well, walking with my dad in the way, being yeah. with him as, as he was going about the long distance of time. And I got a job with another radio station, a private station that Eric Friesen from XCBC had started in Winnipeg, a classical music, music station that was fun. And when I left that, and the reason why I for leaving that was because I came back to Vancouver, that is my father had died. I didn't really know what to do with myself. I tried a few different things and um, I, I kind of had to confront the fact that I was, by that time I was almost 60. I guess I was, yeah, I, I turned 60 more or less when I came back. And it is true, and I'm quite sympathetic towards the employer's point of view at this point, that people aren't eager to hire the older worker. Um, I, once, I applied for a job at a well, it was a major Vancouver arts facility and, okay. and, and it was su su super nice people. And they, they invited me in for an interview. It was a grant writing job. They, they, they invited me in for an interview and they said, oh, we were just so interested. We saw your name on the application, Bill Richardson. We just, like, out of respect, we just had to sit down with you. And I thought, I'm a shoe in Well, I never heard from them. And then I realized, of course, out of respect, it was just that that was what they meant. <laughs> it was be, because we know who you are, we'll give you the courtesy of talking to you, but no, you're not the right person for this job. Yeah. I was, I think I, I was listening to you talking to uh, Terry O'Reilly and you were talking yep. about the, the, how getting fired is a great gift. I yes. absolutely concur. The last job I was fired from, this was quite recently, was from uh, a restaurant, a dim sum restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> where I was hired as a dishwasher, they were just, and, and I was so the wrong person for this job. It was, you it was fired from dishwashing in a dim sum restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and and um, after only a couple of days, but <laughs> they, they they weren't wrong anyway. Um, so so I'm quite used to being fired, but but so being fired and not getting the job, these are these are actually quite good things because I think usually the people who are on the end of making those decisions. Typically, they're not wrong. Like they, they, they yeah. know when you're the right person for the job or not. Whether it's hosting a radio show or whether it's dishwashing. Yeah. Anyway, I, I drifted around and and um, I, I went to Whole Foods because I could get a job there as a dishwasher, and I liked it. It, it was, um, it, it was busy but not overwhelming, unlike the dim sum restaurant. <laughs> yes, that'd be Bellevue. busy. And, <laughs> All those little dishes, it was crazy. Uh, and uh, I like the people, and I like I actually like the work, and uh, which which kind of surprised me. And I did. This is true. I wish I could say that I went there with complete ease of purpose and mind and equanimity and so on and so forth. I didn't really. I actually did have to get over myself. I, you know, it's come. To, it's come to this. How are the mighty fallen? Somebody actually said that to me one day. Yes, I bet they did. What are you doing here? I said, I'm washing dishes. Just, how are the mighty fallen? <laughs> exactly. I uh, anyway. You know, I remember uh, when I came out as a gay person back in the seventies. That I thought that um, I, I thought it was going to be sort of over for me that everybody would, that all anybody else would ever think about was, was like, that oh, he's gay. And, yeah. and the, the, the best lesson about this was that actually nobody else gave a damn. Yeah. And, and th th there might have been a moment of surprise. Like, nobody missed lunch because of this news. You know what I mean? Right. right. And similarly with this is the point I'm trying to make is that you need to remember in all these things is that, Really, you just need to do what's good for yourself. And what was good for myself was to get out of my apartment and to get out of my head and to do something that I could use that made sense for a person of my age that would allow me to use my body, that would allow me to be in a place that was social because none of those things were operative in the life that I was leading. Yeah. It was tending towards day drinking. And and I just thought, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's not a good place to go. It is, it is not yeah. a good yeah. place to go. And and the the one of the weird things about being this age, I'm 66. Now it would be perfectly appropriate for me to die tomorrow. Nobody will be surprised. On the other hand, I could 
easily go on for another 30 years. Yep. Well, so what are you going to do for 30 years if that's time you given the genes in your family? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yep. anyway, I just thought best to get out. And that was what allowed me to do it. But but I think what you've said, which is so important, is you needed to get over yourself. Oh, you yeah. Needed, I mean, you tell a story about, you know, being called to go and receive an honorary doctorate, <laughs> you know, um, but you have to show up at Whole Foods to kind of unpack the bags, right? Well, no, this, the, what, yeah, what happened there was... Uh, it, it, this was, it was it was my first day. It was it was a Friday. It was uh, and, and so I was new to all the gear, the the apron and the gloves and the, the, just the, the, the spray and the smell and, and and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was feeling a little bit overwhelmed. And it was my break time, and I looked at my phone, and there were these two things. One was this inquiry if I'd be willing to accept an honorary doctor for me, doctorate from an institution I will not name. And it didn't happen in the end. Maybe they heard that I was washing dishes, but it was it was a it was a letter of inquiry. And yep. how many how many have you got of those honorary doctors? You must have like a dozen or something. I have fourteen. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, and so there was that, and then there was this text from my from my partner saying, "Hey, I just heard you, and as it happens, and they'd recycled some interview with somebody I done who died, you know, lucky." Yes, yes. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and, and I said, "Oh man, that was then, and this is now." And that yeah. actually, I remember, I remember being in a play once in, in university and and having some accident on the stage. It was. It, a gun, a, a gun was supposed to go off, and it didn't go off, and and it was one of those horrible, embarrassing moments. But it, it kind of shook me up in the right way. I, you just realize oh, you just got to go on with it, and this was yep. exactly that feeling that oh, okay, well that was then, this is now. Let's just see what happens, and and it's it's been fun. It's been fun. Well, I, I I often think of. I mean, it's not dissimilar from our conversation at the beginning, which is. The reason we like to go home mm -hmm. is because there's a comfort there because there are people there that you know and they accept you and they don't care what you did or whether you were famous or not famous or any of the rest of it. And it's kind of, I'm sure, what it's like for you at work, which is you're Bill Richardson, you're Bill who does this. You come to work, you're a fun guy, you have a sense of humor. It's not about whether you spent 30 years, um, you know, discussing the opera or anything else. Yeah, that's that's true. Although, I will tell you that um, after that piece came out, yeah, it began circulating amongst my Your co-workers. It yeah. changed a little bit. And the okay. people, people, I've got a, a very cordial relationship with I think all of the people I work with but um they would start to me and saying oh, I didn't know you were famous yeah <laughs> was like, well were I famous you would have known I was <laughs> 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 so <laughs> and and so that's that's been kind of interesting but that went on for maybe just a day or two and, and now it's just back to and it's just normal the other thing you said and and I I kind of you know nobody talks about what's on Twitter or yeah. social justice or identity politics or cancel culture. They just, they work and talk about what goes on in day to day and what matters. They're probably more interested in inflation than they are about identity politics. Oh no. Like we are just, we are just all gather around and we're amazed at how Tina can build a mountain out of the mangoes. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, seriously, people, I, I, I really admire the people I work with. They, I, I, I'm old fashioned, you know, I like, I like a work ethic, I have to say, yep. and I see it all the time. And it is, um, it is simply a diverse workplace by mm -hmm. dint of being what it is. People from all over the world, um, gay people, straight people, trans people, and people just, no one makes a big deal out of yeah. anything. And I, I I, I don't. It's not that I think it's inappropriate to make a big deal of some things when a big deal needs to be made. But for for, for me, it's become this place. And I don't want to get too rosy about it. It's, it's a workplace. It's Whole Foods. Yeah. It's a big company, and, yeah. and 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 of course, it has its its own liabilities and frustrations. Of course, it does. But workplace doesn't. Um, but but for the most part, 
it's 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 companionable mm-hmm. and people look out for each other and they care for each other and there's you know what there is and i think i value this more than anything else and this is absolutely a legacy from my father it's courtesy i just people are nice to one another yeah. and and uh so to to come to that uh it's yeah it can't it, always be said of the CBC or of politics or any of those. No, things. no, it can't, I, I suppose it can't always be. Although again, my, my yeah. experience with the CBC was, you know, there again, it was a workplace. There, yeah. there were yeah. moments, and 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 God knows there were more than a few. I I I, I can think of them. I'm embarrassed to say where I was a complete jerk. Yeah. Uh, but um, sometimes you're a jerk defensively. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you're just a jerk because you're a jerk. Uh, the, 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 the former, I don't much mind the latter. I, yeah, I, exactly. I, repent, I repent, but anyway, there you go. It's, it's, it's a job. I, I do it. It, it, for the time being, yeah. it's, it's fine. It won't be forever. What I, what I loved about the story was the, the process of getting there, right. Which is yeah. you. And I think a lot of people at our age and stage have to deal with this issue, which is, you know, the the boomers and people have to get out of the way so the next generation can come. Yeah. Employers have good and bad, but mostly legitimate reasons for saying, I don't want a bunch of old folks around that, you know, are going to be costly and don't have the energy of the young generation. So we do have to find things that are going to satisfy us on different levels in different ways than we were used to being satisfied for so many years. I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, again, for for me, fifty percent of what I value with what I do is the social aspect of it. Yeah. My, yeah. my communication with my colleagues and also with the public because I'm there in the store. I'm stocking shelves and, and I talking to people. It's it's the story of my neighborhood. I mean, I know everybody who's coming in there pretty much. And 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 um, so so that's that that's really great. It's a little community center in a way, and especially during COVID, this was so because right. it was it was shopping. It was one of the few sanctioned things. It was one yep. of the things people could do. So so there's that. But I don't think that I could do it happily if I didn't actually like the work itself. And I do. I say yeah. this unashamedly. I put stuff on shelves. I, I mean, I do a few other things as well. But but in the main, that is what I do. And and. Um, it probably doesn't speak highly of me when I tell you it's so that I actually take satisfaction from it. I take satisfaction from putting things correctly yeah. <laughs> in their right place. And uh, and to walk through a store and to look at the shelves you face and you pulled everything forward and everything is in its neat little row and the shelves are as full as they possibly can be and it looks bountiful and there's a time of plenty and yada, yada, yada. Oh my <laughs> darling. It's a satisfaction like none other. But it's- honestly, we find that, you know, when I, I run around the world and sit in a, in a you know, the Parliament of Canada, etc. But going home and digging in the dirt and literally getting your hands dirty and then seeing something grow, I'm telling you, it's hard to get more satisfaction than that. No, it's I, I I totally understand that. It's and it's, I think it's like your shelves. You know, you've done that. You've done it well. You've I mean, and you're there's some physical labor, so you feel like you've actually yeah. earned a rest. <laughs> but you know, it is it, it 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 does give you as well a kind of optic into how we view and how we value yeah. work. I mean, you look at that book for any look, look at last week, and it's it doesn't say anywhere on there. He is a clerk at Whole Foods, right? No. It, it, it just talks, and 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 um, if I get asked to uh, MC, it still occasionally happens. I'll do a public interview or MC a concert yeah. or something like that. I mean, I, I do it now and again, it's fun. Um, and uh, but it, if if there's a little bio in the program, it never says he is a clerk at Whole Foods. Right. It, it's it's it, so we do. We're conditioned to this, right? We value yeah. it because. Who would care about that in that context? Like, but on the other hand, why wouldn't you care about that in that context? Yeah. Why, why can't somebody who is a clerk at Whole Foods, absent all the rest of it, if he, she, can can do the job, why shouldn't they be? Yeah. But of course, it's just not the way we work. But, but I think actually maybe, and and you've kind of alluded to this, that, that COVID in a funny way has 
changed the playing field because the people who really mattered to us were the people who were stocking shelves in the store and the nurses and the doctors and the people who were feeding people. And, and it did kind of shift. I mean, all of that uh, work with your brain could kind of carry on on zoom, but what really mattered was can the food or the medicine get to grandma or to my neighbor? Yeah, sure. Sure. Of course. Yeah. I loved saying I was a frontline worker. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I'll be out there. You've, you've inspired me because I, when I grow up, I want to work in a florist shop. I've always wanted to do that. That is beautiful. And, you know, just be surrounded by that. So you've kind of, charted a course here, Mr. Richardson. I think it's lovely. You've said it can all be done. Well I'll I'll come and I'll buy a I'll buy a bouquet and will you? Yeah if, if you're if you're having difficulty one day making an arrangement we could uh, making an arrangement we could just say oh I'm suffering from Flora's slug. <laughs> I could do that. I'd have all sorts of excuses. And when I come to Vancouver I'm going to come to Whole Foods and say you look so much like Bill Richardson. Are you his brother? <laughs> what she said is, do you remember Bill Richardson? <laughs> that was even better. And I thought, I, I, the cool thing, I feel, I, I hope I get to see her again, because I, I, I feel badly about it. I, 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 thought, I thought she was joking, and I, I said, yeah, vaguely. And then she didn't cover it, off she went. <laughs> Well, yeah. If, if you're to, next time you come to Vancouver, uh, come to Whole Foods if you like. But then we'll we'll repair down to the Sylvia and have ourselves a smart martini or something. Okay, we'll do that for sure. I just I want to thank you for this book um, because, as somebody who cares about this issue and is involved in this issue, it's important. This is a really um, good thing to do as we reach out to everybody at all ages and stages that needs to think about this. It's it's a hard fraught conversation, and yeah. it, needs, it needs to be that. It's never yeah. going to be straightforward. It's never yeah. going to. It's never a conversation that's going to achieve anything like unanimity. No, nope. not everybody's ever going to be happy about whatever the outcome. For sure. But yeah, uh, what what we what we need, what we require, what what I think we really need, need to to demand is our agency, and mm-hmm. and um, in in this and and in other areas as well. well yeah. let me, I'll, I'll thank you um, for, for all the work you're doing in, in the public domain and the public sphere um, around this question, Pamela, because it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that you have been, over the years, you, you've been involved in a lot of really, really emotional, difficult conversations. And I know you have your own experience of this. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's why we're there. We all pick our spots, right? And our, um, so find this book. It's called Last Week, and it's beautifully illustrated by Emily LeDuc. Um, does she say Emily or Emily? The weirdness is, I think I think she's probably Emily, but I have yeah. never spoken to You've her. You've never met. Isn't that amazing? We, we exchanged a, an email once or twice, but I've yeah. never, never met her. They so. illustrate. But Crazy yeah, I, I appreciate the work she did for sure. Yeah, it's a lovely book. Thank you. Um, it's great to connect with you again. Thank you, for sure. I'm so glad this kind of brought us together in a, in a weird way. And um, all I can say is Bill Richardson used to be famous and now he's important and uh, makes a contribution. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. All the best. Bye. 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 Bill Richardson, our guest on no nonsense with Pamela Mullen. Thanks so much for being with us today. Bye-bye for now.